Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School this morning, and we are so happy that you could join us as we study the lesson, Abraham's Seed. Uh, before we get started, however, we do have a testimony from Sister Mary Lou, so we will go ahead and start with her testimony. Well, I, I'd like to just share something that I felt like the Lord really helped me with this week. I was in a Bible study, and the subject came up about prophecy. And the lady that I was studying with is from um, the West Indies, and she has a lot of familiarity with uh, things that are of a um, wicked spiritual nature. And so we were talking about prophecy and she was sharing with me some things that she had been told by a prophet um, years ago and i was trying to share with her about how a prophet the qualifications for being a prophet for always being correct and that it was really for the building up of the church and so on and so i really wasn't getting through as good as i was hoping so i was getting a lot of feedback but in the way of objection so, um, so her experiences were things that were, to me, a little scary, actually. And so we talked about it at great length. And finally, and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, in my head, I need help with this because I don't want to lose this lady here. And I need, what should I do? So the Lord answered my prayer within seconds. And he gave me the text about Balaam and the talk, the talking donkey. So I opened and I said, look, let's open the Bible. We're going to look at this. And so we opened to, uh, let me tell you exactly where I was. I um, want to say we were in uh, numbers, I think 22, numbers 22, and uh, read 22 through 35. So I read this story to her, and she listened, and she said, I think I understand what you're saying. Now, the story of Balaam and this donkey are that. Uh, Balak had sent for Balaam and he wanted Balaam to curse uh, the Israelites and Balaam didn't want to do it at first and then he agreed to do it. I think that's the gist of the story and he decided that um, he would go and he said well whatever the Lord curses, I'll curse, and whatever the Lord blesses, I'll bless, something like that. Anyway, the donkey's going along, and he's riding on this donkey, and the donkey sees the angel of the Lord, only the angel of the Lord here is Jesus Christ himself, and the donkey stops, and the donkey turns the by the side and goes off into the field, and Balaam is so angry at this donkey, can't figure it out, makes this donkey get back in line, get back on the trail and walking along again. And a second time, the angel of the Lord appears and this donkey. Now they're in a place where the donkey can't really do too much. So he tries to get along by scooting up against a wall. I, may, I might be getting completely confused because I haven't read it in a day or two. But anyway, um, so Balaam is beating this donkey. So the finally, third time comes and the donkey sees again the angel of the Lord and it stops dead in its tracks and it goes right down on the ground and it's not moving anymore. That's it. It's not moving. So the Lord works a miracle and the Lord gives the donkey a voice. So Balaam says, you know, um, he's yelling at the donkey and the donkey says, why are you beating me? So, you know, Balaam has this conversation, short conversation. My point in saying this was to her that the Lord can use 
whatever means necessary to get a message across. Now, was the donkey a prophet of the Lord at that moment? Yes. And was the prophet that she had been listening to a prophet? Possibly at that moment. But as it went on later on, she determined that this guy was not a true prophet by the fact that everything he said didn't always come true. Everything wasn't for the edifying of the church and so on. So anyway, I'm just praising the Lord that he helped me answer a very difficult question in her mind. And I believe that she understood it. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, a lot of times we wonder, how can we do things? How can we say things? How can we teach others when we don't know ourselves? And this is proof that the Holy Spirit can just drop it in your mind and bring something back to remembrance that's perfect for that time to be able to share with others. Yeah, I I, I hope I explained it correctly, Pastor, but um, I think I did. Um, that poor donkey. <laughs> Awesome. And so now we will um, open up the floor for prayer requests and praise reports. I know we've been praying for a lot of people over this time, um, over the last year, actually. Uh, we, we're been, we've been in the pandemic mode for a year and doing this ministry for about a year. So um, any praise reports or uh, prayer requests that we have for, uh, for this morning? This morning? There are several prayer requests um, that we need to we need to uh, put them up in in, um, in our prayers. And I will ask all of those who are watching us today. Several families are in need, and they have challenged um, health challenges they have. So let's keep them in our prayers. And I have a praise report slash prayer request. Um, a, a colleague of mine is in India and her in the middle of all of everything that's going on with COVID there. And her dad was in the hospital, which actually was a blessing because they accepted him into the hospital, which means that they expect him to live um, because they were refusing people away if they didn't think they could recover. And he is now home and recovering from COVID at home. So and she and her mom did not contract COVID. So it was just him and he had double bronchial pneumonia um, and they got his levels down and he was stable enough to come home. So praise report that he's home and prayer request that Mr. D'Souza um, oh. continues to heal. That's wonderful. I have um, a prayer request for a friend in Michigan. Her name is uh, Michelle Grace and she has walking pneumonia. And she's been pretty sick. And also continue prayers for Sister Osborne um, okay. with her health. How is Saul's son? I don't think we've gotten an update recently, so. Okay, should we probably should pray for Jonathan? All right, any other prayer request? If not, we will ask Sister Heather to pray for our prayer request and to open our Sabbath school this morning. And you're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> there we go. Satan is busy. <laughs> okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the week you've brought us through. Lord, we praise you because we are all still healthy. We have roof over our heads and you have provided food for us. Lord, we thank you for the many things you have kept back from us this week. And we thank you for the many things you have given us. And Lord, with joyful hearts, we come before your throne of grace on this Sabbath day to praise you and worship you because you are the one true God and worthy of praise. On this holy time, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We bow humbly before you. We praise you and we thank you for all that you are and that all that you have done for us. We ask you, Lord, to incline your ears to our prayers because, Lord, we are still in this world. We have not yet come home with you and we need you every moment and every hour. We pray, Lord, for the families who are facing challenges. Lord, even though we know you have won the victory, 
we, we struggle sometimes. We struggle a lot of times, Lord. And we ask you please to intervene, to remind us, to remind them that you have won the victory for us and that we only need to trust in you, to obey you, to rely upon your word. And we also will have victory in here. So Lord, as they face challenges with health, help them remember that you are the great physician. As they face financial challenges, Lord, help them remember that you are the creator and the owner of, us, of everything. And that Lord, you can use any means and all means to provide for them and bless them. And that you have promised that your children will not go without, that you'll always be with us and that you are there waiting to shelter us, to protect us like a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. You care so much for each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to remember to just call upon you. Lord, we, we praise your holy name. We praise you that Mr. D'Souza not only is recovered, but he was able to have treatment in hospital and that he is home. Continue to heal him, Lord. Continue to bless him and let him know that what he has gone through and the recovery he had is not because of luck. It's not because of the hospital, but it's because of you, yeah. the one true God who has brought him through because you have given him time to serve you, to give his heart to you and to be a witness for you. Help him to send the Holy Spirit to give him thoughts and incline his ear and his heart to, to your call, to your love call, Lord. We also pray for Sister Osborne as she continues to face challenges with her health. Lord, help her to overcome. Help her to be a witness for you, a testimony for faith and trusting in you, even when we don't know the outcome, Lord. We ask you please to be with me, Michelle Grace as she recovers from pneumonia. Lord, sickness and death stalks us on every hand. But we thank you, Lord, that you have promised that you are preparing a place for us where there is no more sickness, no more death, no more crying, no more tears. And Lord, even though we struggle here, Help us not to look at the immediate, but cast our eyes upon your promise and the hope you have given us so that we can say that we know who holds the future and we trust in you. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray for Jonathan. You only you alone knows, Lord, what he's going through. We ask for peace and comfort for his family. We ask that our prayers, our petitions, ascend into the courts of heaven as a sweet smelling savor, Lord, Mm -hmm. because our prayer shows that we, we trust you, we depend upon you, and we know that only you can heal, only you can provide, only you can we abide in and find peace, Lord. We ask you please to incline your ear again and grant us your peace. Bless us with a special blessing on this holy set-aside time. And Lord, as... The donkey spoke to Balaam, Lord. Let the things that we say come from you so that others hearing will be led to glorify your name, that they will have insight and wisdom into your word. We ask you please to take over so that what we say will bring honor and glory to your name. Mm -hmm. We ask you please to bless each and every one of us speaking. Bless those who are hearing. Bless those who are trying to decide. Bless our pastor and his family and give him strength and wisdom and understanding. It's my prayer in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And thank you so much for that opening prayer, for praying for our prayer request, Sister Heather. And so now we will jump into our lesson. As I mentioned earlier, it's Abraham's seed. Um, and this is continuing with the covenant of Abraham that we discussed last week, and I believe the week before. I'm going to a little bit more into depth a little bit more um, 
with this lesson. And this one, as always on Sunday, they always have very interesting stories. I want to share that story with you all. So it talks about a, um, a, in a small town, there was a jeweler who had a clock and everyone walked past this clock every morning and they would use this clock to see what time it is. So, you know, as they're going to work, they're like, oh, you know, I have 10 minutes to get there. As the kids are going to school. They're like, oh, I have time to get to school. Well, one day this clock stopped, but no one knew. So they're walking past this clock and they look at the time and they go, oh, I still have plenty of time. The kids going to school, people going to work and everyone was late that morning because they were relying on something that they had known to be accurate through time, but it stopped. And they, so their reliance was on something that was not reliable at all. And so it, we're going to look at what we rely on. Where are we telling our time? What are we using to, to measure where we are? Um, so let's go ahead and look at Sunday's lesson. If we can get someone to read Deuteronomy 7, 6. I have 7, 6. Okay. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God had chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that, that, that are upon the face of the earth. And then we're also going to read Ezekiel 16, 8. It's Ezekiel 6, chapter 16, verse 8. I have it. Okay. Verse eight says, when I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was this time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord God. Okay. So in looking at that second verse, we can see that God chose his special people. He chooses. He actually is very intentional about that. And in knowing this, because of course, those who were chosen, they understood this. How can God's chosen people, as in Deuteronomy 7 says, be above all people that are upon the face of the earth, yet still be humble? I, I, think, um, I think in verse Ezekiel 8, where it says, um, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. They have to see their nakedness at all times. <laughs> that's, that's the thing about it, because um, God chose them, not because they were particularly smart, not because they were particularly faithful, um, because he, he chose them for his because of his own will, mm -hmm. and uh, I think <laughs> I was thinking about that about the chosen people, and I think God chose them because they were so sinful. Mm. You know, you could see for for us living now, and uh, um, we have the Bible, right? We have the Word of God. And there is every single sin in this book that people have done. Um, and it shows how God navigates through those sins, wooing people back to him, forgiving them. So I think he chose these people because he knew they were going to be so sinful. And he could show us, he could show the world that there is nothing that you can do that will make me not love you and take you away. And, 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 re and reject you. And um, I think in Ezekiel, they needed to have realized how naked they were and how in need they were. And if it was not for God spreading his proverbial skirt over them, there'll be a, a shame and a byword to the rest of the world. I think that's a very interesting um, analogy to see that they had to realize that. Go ahead, Pastor. Yeah, I, I, I watched in 
and observing the Bible that every time when a human being is a humble human being, God is raising him, is lifting him up. Um, and this is why he has been chosen. In other words, uh, as you know very well, the, the Hebrews, as they were called, or the shepherds, they were very humble uh, individuals. And they are coming from Babylonians. But they were, all the Canaanites, they were, did not like too much the Hebrews. Even though they were, were you know, with the cattle and everything. Uh, Egyptian especially, they were not, they, they, they hated the Jews. They, they, the smell of them, all the sheep and everything, they didn't like it. Uh, but they were humble people. So God has raised them. God, God has a mission, had a purpose for them. And this is why uh, the Deuteronomy chapter 8 also speaks very clearly. I want to read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 8 uh, says this. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Every commandment which I commanded you today, you must be careful to observe. This is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. You be careful to observe so that you might live and multiply and go in and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the day, all way, these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what is in your heart whether you, you will keep his commandments or not. And what, what the pastor speaks about the fact that if individuals, they will obey. In other words, says, make sure, do every effort you know, to observe what I'm saying. In other words, stay in my grace. You become a special people, a people that God has a purpose for them. So humble yourself before God and he will raise you above everybody. But in the same time, it's not that you have to raise above everybody is that to let God to use you above everybody. It doesn't mean that you will be the, the most, the richest man in the world or the smartest individual in the world, but you will be lifted up so that people, they can see Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of being humble before God because Jesus wants you to use, want, want us to use us for his kingdom. Uh, and we have seen in history, many individuals, humble people, they had an incredible story. Martin Luther, a humble monk that has a revolutionary, has, has turned the world upside down. And kingdoms and kings, they could not stay before his, his wisdom. Why? Because they, he humbled himself before God. I think this is the, this is the secret in our lives, to, uh, to let God in our lives. Herschel, I think, too, this has a definite um, connection to the Lord's calling the church his bride because um, when I was reading a, our commentary about this and the Lord called Israel in, in infancy at the very beginning and now Israel is in a sense of marriageable age and mm -hmm. so I thought it was very interesting because we see the Lord use this reference about Israel being his bride this his beautiful uh, this beautiful woman that he he betrothes to himself and here in um Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Ezekiel 16, 8, this is what he's talking about. You become marriageable. You are at that age where you now can be betrothed to me. And I just think it's so beautiful because throughout the whole Bible, the Lord is always referencing this idea of his bride and the, the church. That's us being belonging to him. And I think that continues throughout the lesson. There's another part we're going to revisit that. So I'm glad you broke down the whole um, infancy and, and bride and betrothed part of that relationship. So let's, also, let's continue in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy and let's read Deuteron Deuteronomy. I'm having a hard time saying that tonight. I was today. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, and then we'll read verse 15. So it's Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, and then verse 15. I have it. Okay. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God 
to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. All right, and then skip over to 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Okay, so as a chosen people of God, what, are, what were their obligations um, that are, have been outlined? Because it talks a little bit about with them being above all and being chosen and understanding their nakedness. Um, so what were the obligations? What did they look like? Yeah, actually, that's a good question, actually, because the title says they should be above all nations, all the people. So someone might think maybe they should be the kings, they should be the leaders, but it's, it's a kind of being humble. They should be obeying the Lord's seal. So the requirement is the same as we have seen from the covenant between God and his people. We as people, we have to obey God. So it should be the same way these uh, Israelites too. They should be obeying the Lord. And with this good relationship with God, then they should be attracting people surrounding them to know they are God and then be uh, the good ambassadors of God on this earth. So briefly, they should be obedient to God. In verse nine um, of that same chapter, it says, if you keep my commandments. And verse mm -hmm. 10 then says, then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by my name and they will be afraid of you. But I think that afraid means that they will even reverence the fact that you are a holy people and you are committed to me. And so when you look at these two verses, they were very, um, there was a contrast between those two verses. You know, with the first one saying, you know, it comes to the past, if you obey my, you obey my commandments, then I'll set you high above the earth the nations of the earth. And then 15 says, but if you do not, uh, then all these curses will come unto you. So what does this say about the consequences of our actions? Especially when it comes in relation to the covenant. So this is, this is the same because the covenant is between God and his people, but the people are to surrender themselves to God. And we have seen that if we decide to obey the Lord, we will be blessed. We will be inherited with the land. We will be having all the fruits. We will be having all the riches that people are expecting on this earth. So if you don't do that, there should be curses. So that's why the Lord was putting them. And, and that's, that's how the Lord is, actually. He's putting in front of us or the benediction or the blessings or the curses and it's up to choose so that's exactly what should the israelites do to either to be or to disobey and then get the consequences and may i say too that i i think that israel as they traveled in the wilderness, their clothes didn't wear out their sandals didn't wear out they had obvious um, blessings from the Lord that they should have been able to relate to. Mm -hmm. And the curses that would come would be a consequence of going their own way. They would see that the results of those things were going to bring them problems and troubles. And so I'm glad you brought that out. So I was going to say, were the curses really curses or were they consequences of their actions? And I think you just explained that beautifully on um, what that means. And so as they were going through the, the wilderness, they had this land that was promised to them mm -hmm. as we look through. As do we today, correct? There's a land that's promised to us. So what are our obligations are they different to get to our 
promised land. Um, I know we say it a lot, so it, it doesn't have the impact that I think it really should, because I always say they were going to the promised land. It was the promised land. But when you think about a land that is something that's promised to you um, as part of the covenant, I think that impact is there a little bit. So I know that hit me in the lesson this week. So I want to share that. But what are, are our obligations any different? And what are our obligations to get to our promised land? I think one of the things that we have to remember is that uh, Jesus says in John chapter 10, abide in me, okay, abide in me. I think it's John chapter 17. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, we are abiding in Jesus Christ, stay in Jesus Christ. And we have the aliment, the nutrients that are coming from the vine, the vineyard, okay. I said, Jesus, you are the branches. In other words, if we are tied in Jesus Christ, we are not the one to grow. We are not the one to make progress to the, to the heavenly sanctuary. It's, it's he who is making all the progress, all the steps. And I know that everybody knows that picture where a gentleman had a dream and he saw Jesus walking side by side in, in his dream on the, on the shore, on the, on the beach. And all of a sudden, he saw only two pairs of, you know, walking, you know, what do you call it? Uh, uh, and he said, what, yeah, what footprints, yeah. Where, where, where have you been uh, when I needed you the most? And you know, you remember that he said, hey, I was getting you. In, in, in my back. So that, those are my shoes, those are my footprints. Yeah. So what, what Jesus tries to say is that once that we have uh, accepted Jesus Christ, it is not our journey anymore. It is not our goal anymore. anymore. It is not our, uh, how do you call it, our, our mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, it, it, it is a fact that no matter when it will be that, he promised and he will give us, he will keep his promises. So the first condition for me personally is to abide in Jesus Christ. What does this mean? What practically for those who are watching us means that every single day you have to give yourself to Jesus. You have to say to Senator Copit, Lord, this is not my day. This is not my life. This is not my family. This is not my children. This is nothing. I have nothing at all. Not even myself belong to me. It is up to you. So Lord, I dedicate my life to you. And then is Lord, I want to seek your face because the Bible says very clear to seek his face. He wants us to every single day to talk to us. And she said, Jesus in Isaiah chapter 65, we did see it in the, in the previous le lecture. Uh, I was uh, found by those who were not searching, were not looking for me. But when we search his face, he will be let, he let himself know. So the second point is seek the face of Jesus Christ. Third is find opportunities to share the joy, share the love, share what God has done in your life. When you begin to share Jesus Christ, the process will be that you will be changed. In other words, the, the bath, the, the, the behavior, the sin, the problems you have, Jesus Christ will take upon him and he will give you another mission. And this is in the line of Matthew chapter 11, 28 and 29. It says, come unto me all who are heavy laden and burden, and I will give you rest. Take upon you my cross, my burden, which is the gospel, to preach the gospel, so the salvation to others, and I will give you rest. Uh, so this is, this is the, the third point. So the first one was, you remember? Which one Abide. Was? Abide. Abide. Jesus Christ. Second, seek the face of Jesus. Seek him. That's right. Abide, seek. seek which is Amen. the word of God. And the third one is? Share. Share. Very good. Awesome. So let's move on to um, read Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 8. Is Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 8. Can I hear you, Heather? No. I have it. Okay. <laughs> um, and Jeremiah 11, it says, Yet they obeyed me, yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant 
which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. All right, and then we'll also read Genesis chapter six, verse five. I have it. Okay. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So when we look at the covenant um, with Israel, it gives us the good and the bad. So what happened to Israel when they disobeyed? They suffered the consequences. So many things happened to them. Are, are you looking for specifics? Well, in, in just in this, as um, we looked at, you know, in the last set of texts that we looked at, mm -hmm. they, the Lord told them, if you obey my commandments, this is what you get. And we didn't read the, the entire, this is what you get. Yeah, if you do not obey my so. commandment, mm -hmm. this is what happens. And so we know that there was a diso, that they were disobedient. So what happened after that point? And it's kind of just a general, um, you know, if anyone's into a movies, it's like, is it the red pill or the blue pill? <laughs> if you do this, you get this. If you get this, you get this. Oh. So what happened? I, I think... Okay. Everyone wants to help. <laughs> um, they obeyed and they were blessed by God. Yeah. They disobeyed and they were blessed by Satan. Oh, you know. But they were also attacked. Well, that is Satan's blessing. You know, yeah. they were taken <laughs> up into slavery. They were attacked. They had famine, diseases. Mm. You know, um, and I, I think it speaks to us today too. You know, there are only two masters and you follow this master and you inherit the promised land. You follow the other master and you inherit debt. And go ahead. The, one of the things that we have to understand is that Jesus Christ, when he said something in the Old Testament or New Testament, he fulfilled his word. And we have, we have seen that the reaction of Jesus, it's very clear. If you are not obeying, the winds, I will release the winds to come upon you. In other words, I will remove my hand, okay? And Jesus will let the winds blow. It's the picture of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7. There will be a period of time when God will do justice. In other words, what he promised, he will fulfill his word. Now, I was talking yesterday with a, with a friend of mine, and I said, everything that, that God had desire for his people, um, if they were obeying, they they were blessed but you know all the all the all the curse or all the the how do you call it the punishment was not and has not been designed to be for a for a human being it's all the this all the punishment is designed to be for satan uh because he was rebellious and he did not obey his grace has come to an end on the cross also was the last point and he has no turning back for him so those who are following him are suffering the consequence in other words Jesus is love, but in the same time when he says love means justice and he'll punish you. Um, it's, so this is a message that we have to understand because people today, they say, because Jesus loves us, he will forgive everybody, no matter what sin you have, no matter what immorality you are in right now, uh, you know, Jesus will, will allow you in, in his love, and his love. And uh, Jesus is love, but it's not love in your sin, it's love out of your sin, coming out loves you person but doesn't, doesn't love your sin but if you for instance uh comfort yourself or, or accommodate yourself or you leave the the scene and you you become seen and and jesus is coming also to punish us so this is the curse the, the bible says very clear i will punish you i will go after you because i love you i will punish you that i will make you bring come back uh, but if you finally you say i don't want i don't need you you go by your own but also God have the wrath of God will come upon us. So it's not, it's not something that, you know, it's, it's uh, how do you call it, easy or, or to play with. <laughs> not whatever I want to do, you know, whatever I want to come to Jesus, he's available. And if I don't need him, you know, um, he, he, so no, it's not about that. It's not about when you want, it's about when he wants. So the consequences of all actions, the consequences of all actions, they have a reaction. And God says, Hey, come to me. 
all who are weary, come to me, come reconcile. Let's look for the face. And we have seen the previous lesson of, of, uh, of in, um, in Isaiah, how God told, uh, I think was, uh, um, I forget the, the king's name uh, in the beginning, when he said, don't go after the Assyrians. Don't go and look their faces. Come back, come. And he won't. And then the, the, the Lord has let him deal with that. And the consequences were dramatic. And Sister Mary Lee, you had something? Well, I, I guess I was thinking about the fact that the Lord's curses are things that are designed to help us see the error of our ways. It's like I was thinking of my my youngest son years and years ago when we lived in Colorado and he and uh, uh, Zach, our older son, went off with their couple of buddies and they were riding their bicycles. And we always cautioned them, you know, about riding your bicycle, being very, very careful on this one particular street because it was very busy. And we didn't want them to go that way. We wanted them to come through the subdivision where we live. But one day I got a knock at the door and there was a man who was just red in the face. He was, he was upset and he said, I followed your son home because your son was all over the road. And he said he could have gotten hit by a car. And he said, in particular, by me. And he said, you need to do something about that. Well, boy, I sure did. I hopped right on it. And so Luke wasn't allowed to ride his bike for a couple of weeks. But I punished him because I wanted him to learn something. And I believe that God is the same way. He gives us so many blessings. We, we have air to breathe and we can see and we can walk and we talk. And some of us lose some of those things. But in general, we are all blessed by the rain and we are all blessed by the sun and, and these things. And then when we have something that goes wrong in our life, it's not always God's fault. He doesn't always allow bad things to happen, but sometimes he has to wake us up. Just like I had to give Luke a good talking to, and you know, he was off his bicycle for several weeks because he didn't listen to us and he almost got hit by a car. There is another event that pop up in my mind uh, about the, the blessings of God. And it's the story of David. And David one day has been seen with, uh, you know, with Bathsheba and the Lord and the Lord asked him, choose something, choose one of the, and he said something incredible that, that's so beautiful. He said, it's better to, to, um, to suffer the consequences from the, from God's hands than from men. It, it's better, to, it's better to, to be punished by God than by men or by Satan, you know, by men. So God's God's uh, punishment or God's curse uh, are its love, its redemption, its, its purpose of, of uh, directing us to the to the to the uh, the way, and also to reveal in our hearts. As, as Deuteronomy chapter uh, seven uh, said, very uh, eight said very clear that, that that you might know your own thoughts, uh, um, that you might see where you are and return. So this is this is the purpose of God is punishing his people only with the purpose of redemption. But there will be a time when God will not punish only for the purpose of redemption, but will be uh, the consequences of our sin. And God God will, will, will have to clothe his strange clothes, uh, how do you call it, clothes uh, with uh, wrath. Okay. And that, that's that is not, not a pleasant and not, not desire for anybody to feel it, but this is his justice. In other words, those people who have mistreated or misbehaved, uh, this does consider God's grace and criminals and individuals who have not taken in consideration his, his, his love, they will suffer the consequences of their own actions, unfortunately. Yeah. So I let's... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Hello, we, we, yes, we have talked about a lot on this point, but I just want to say something about the choice because this is a, a, an issue of choice i put you mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 blessings and i put the cast in front of you so it's up to you to choose in fact if you go through their journey they were coming out of egypt 
ready to go to Canaan. So the Lord reminded them of his laws. That's when he gave them actually the Ten Commandments again, just to remind them that they have to be obedient so that they can remain in the land that is going to be given to them. But as we have seen through their history, they didn't do what was requested to them. That's why even the land deal, which is Monday, and even if you go on Tuesday, we see that they didn't obey to the Lord. And then because of their disobedience, they were invaded by various nations like Assyrians, like the, Bab the Babylonians. They ended up losing their land. And then they were, it's not that the Lord was punishing them. They were receiving the consequences of their bad actions. But still, as we see from the lesson, the Lord is still having his people. So that's what I wanted to mention. And I'm glad you actually said that, Ashil, because uh, the verses I was going to pull out, we won't read the verses, but it talked about, and it kind of puts what you said and what Sister Mary Lou said earlier on the um, them being his the bride at that point. So Jeremiah, cha Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 1 and verses 20 talks about... Um, I'll actually read it. They say, if a man to put his away his wife, she go from him and become another man. Shall he return to her again? Unto her again, shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Surely, as a wife treacher treacherously departed from her husband, so ye have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. So. When you look at this, um, and I think I read it here or somewhere else, it talks about how when they got the land, the promised land, the first time, it was pure. It was theirs. Um, it was undefiled. And then when they went and did what they wanted to do, to return to it, it's not the same. So when looking at this and looking at everything we just said with the consequences and God, they were cho God's chosen people, yes, and they may have returned, but it wasn't the same. What does that say about the concept of once saved, always saved? Oh, mm -hmm. it's an interesting question. It says there is no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because you, <laughs> um, they, they had a choice to walk away because the breaking of the covenant is um, a breaking of the relationship that they had with God. So the, the relationship that they had with God in the beginning of the covenant is them being saved. And then they decided, I want no part of this relationship. That guy down the street looks better than you. I'm going to go with him. So they broke that relationship and they went off. So you can walk away from your relationship. So that means you could walk away from the saving grace of God. And some people, some people do it by backsliding and some people do it deliberately, knowing exactly what they're doing, says, I, I don't want part of this. I don't want part of this God. I'm going to do my own thing. And so when we look at that, how do we rebuild that relationship? And why is that relationship so important to us not falling into the trap of sin? It's a relationship has been compared to the marriage it's like between a man and a woman. Every time you have to, to renew your, your commitments, you have to keep, you have to, to remain obedient, you have to still love your, your, your partner. So this is the same with the Lord too. You cannot say, oh, I, I love you, that's it. We need to to be also characterized by the good action. Because the Lord says, if you love me, you obey to my commandments. And this is something we go through every day. It's a daily decision to keep that relationship, to keep, as Heather was saying, to, to remain obedient. So it's something which is renewed on a daily basis. And the thing, the thing about the relationship is that the love God has for us as the husband, is a, it's an unfathomable love. It's a love that defies understanding. Because even though um, we stray away, he still calls to us and tells you, I love you. I, I love you with a never-ending love. 
you know, I love you enough to forgive you and take you back again. You know, um, and he and he will woo us. He will woo us and woo us. Anybody know what woo woo means? <laughs> <laughs> he woos us and he pleads with us to, to come back. You know, um, my niece and I were talking about um, grounds for dissolution, dissolution of relationships. And some things we are hard and fast on. There is no forgiveness. There is no coming back. You know, I told her in some things, the bridge is burned. The lumber has been scattered away. The river has been dammed. There is no coming back. There is no crossing over. But God is not like that. You know, once you once you could hear him, he's going to call to you and call to you. That That's how much he loves you. Because if my husband strays away, he could keep on straying. Don't come back. But he will, he will call you and call you and call you and trouble your heart and say, I love you. I love you. Come back. And even though you're stray, he's not going to withhold his blessings. You still have life. You still have health. You still have energy. He still gives you strength to work and put a roof over your head. You know, <laughs> who is a God like our God? You know, it's amazing. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, di dig into three verses. Uh, the first one is Isaiah chapter four, verse three. And then I will also tell you the other two so you, we can have other people grab those. Uh, the second one is Micah chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And the third is Ze Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. And we will start with Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3. Somebody. Anyone have that? I have it if you don't. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. You can read Micah 6, 7. I mean 4, 6, 7. Okay. In that, in that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lamb, I will assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lamb my remnant, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over the the Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. All right, and then Zephaniah chapter three, verses twelve and thirteen. Zephaniah? Yes. Zechariah. Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Twelve and thirteen. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. All right, so after all of this talk about curses and disobedience, what hope can we find in these verses? Some Any? still remain true. Some still remain true to the covenant, and the covenant was held to the end. God honored his covenant to the very end. You know, even if it's one person, he will honor the covenant with that one person. And we see here a, a big hope um, in every single generation. Um, that God has maintained his faithful people and he will come to rescue those faithful people. That, that's a big uh, hope that we have. In other words, um, the Lord is faithful in his promises and he will honor his, uh, his uh, promise. And he said in John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, 3, I will go and prepare a place for you uh, where I will be, you also can be. So this promise is this promise of the Lord is is uh, coming along little by little by little. We see the events happening right now in the world, and we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, because all things has been has been fulfilled in our lives and also in the Bible. We have seen clear. This is a testimony of His covenant that He has fulfilled His part. Therefore, the last part is it's a little bit longer. Like right now, probably maybe a year. Maybe maybe half, maybe I do not know. Uh, 
but the more we go in, in time, the, the longer we uh, appears to be this period of time was of, of waiting the second coming of Jesus, but he will fulfill his promise. I think it's key that, you know, we remember that the Lord repeats again and again and again throughout the, the entire Old Testament, especially. He always talks about there being this remnant. He will have a remnant. So he, what he's saying is, I have made this covenant with Israel and they failed, but there is spiritual Israel. So I'm going to be faithful to my covenant right down to the very last because I will have a remnant. There will be people who will love me and, and want to obey me. And the hope that we have is that if we are faithful, we can be part of that remnant. God is not going to go back on his promise. And all we need to do is to be faithful to him. And we can be part of that remnant too. And uh, I also want to remind you that the remnant are the people who kept their eyes on God. Because the, the rest of Israel, while the rest of Israel was worshiping Baal and doing all these other uh, wicked and evil things, the remnant said, as to me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So when everybody around you is losing their head, you keep yours on and serve the Lord. Amen. And so uh, as you... Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Shio. That, that story of Joshua reminds me of the Elijah too, uh, when he was uh, calling the Israelites to reject their idols after showing to them that the Lord is the Lord and Ahab they were worshiping was not, I mean, the, the idols they were worshiping, they were not the, 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 the good okay. God, the right God. Then at a certain time, Elijah was a little bit uh, weak saying, oh, I'm remaining alone. I don't have any other people to worship with me. But the Lord told him, don't really be afraid. I have 7,000 who have never worshiped Ahab. So even today, the Lord has his remnant. There are some people who are obedient to him, who are worshiping him according to his commandment, according to his, to his will. So the remnant will always exist till the end of this world. And as we look at the remnant, and we know that in order to be a, uh, for these people to be a part or for us to be a part, it's, you have to stand up for things that are unpopular. And so at the end of the lesson um, on Wednesday, it talks about a young woman who gave up her Christian faith because she was discouraged by the sin, apostasy, and hypocrisy she saw in her local church. And she was using that, she was saying that the people in the church, they weren't Christians, so she was just going to give it all up. Why is her excuse not valid based on this concept of the remnant? Because God never told you to look at the other people around you. He said, keep your eyes fixed on me, obey me, follow me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, if when everybody else is losing their head, keep yours on. I you know, remember. because imagine, imagine coming before the throne of grace and saying, um, Jesus said, I died for you and I asked you to follow me. And you said, well, well, Heather was doing this and that and she was so deceitful. I decided I'm not going to follow you, you know. That makes a lot of sense, right? No. <laughs> when I when I uh, when I uh, became a Christian, uh, because I was not um, 15 years ago, around 15 years ago, I had a struggle, the same struggle that this this girl had, because I knew uh, who who is the church, and I know the church. Uh, church in the church are coming sick people. Are not coming the the well the, those who are you know. Uh, saints. The saints are staying outside of the church, but the sick people they are coming in the church because those who are well, for instance, those who consider that they are well, okay, they don't need church. So the people who are coming in the church are only sick people, okay. Those people who have huge problems. This is why we are coming to the to the hospital, okay. And not, you don't go to the hospital because you are well. I, I hate hospitals. Even the smell of the hospital, I hate it. But I have to go every week, more or less, because of uh, my job. But it's, it's, it's not a good place to stay in the church. And 
this is my, this was my 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 biggest struggle uh, when when God has called me and I gave my life to Him. Uh, Lord, what am I supposed to do in the church? You know, seeing all these hypocrites, uh, you know, all these individuals, the leaders that they are fighting for the position. I knew I knew what was because I left completely the church when I was young, uh, younger. So uh, my challenge was going back and to see all these people to stumble or to move forward outside and to create, to, to evangelize, to speak about Jesus, those who, who do not know about Jesus. And I asked God, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, you know, for some people who are struggling in the church, and I understand your concern, I've I passed through that. It is not the time, it's not the place or the time to say, I'm not going anymore there. But it is well for you if God is calling you and you don't feel comfortable, just start a ministry in the church and outside of the church. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to leave completely the church. God's church is not about an institution. It's not about a box. It's about a mission. A remnant church is not about an institution. The institution is the one to, to uh, create an environment, to create a space, to create a, a place where God's people, the remnant people, are coming together, but not the institution represents the remnant, okay? Only the institution, it's a symbol of the, okay? But what we have to understand very clearly that uh, there are people who are challenged about what happens in the church, and I understand your problem. I, I pass through them. But right now, I see myself um, comfortable in the church. No matter what's going on, I, I became strong and by God's grace. Uh, uh, doing a mission outside, and I understand that God's people at the Seventh day Adventist Church uh, is a church that God has designed with a purpose, and the purpose is to spread the gospel to others. So, you have plenty of things to do outside of the church, inside of the church. If you feel that, that somebody is not loving you or they hate you, hey, start a ministry to love them. I don't know what I don't know what type of ministry, but start praying and start changing things in your church because the lord has made you valuable and you are priests for king for for god's children for, for for his kingdom and you have value in yourself in other words the remnant doesn't stay in what others do but what god has called you to do so change the environment wherever you are because god has called you to stay strong amen Amen. So let's uh, dig into, thank you for that, for sharing that experience too, Pastor. I think that um, hits home with a lot of people and shows that it, there's, like Heather said, you shouldn't pay attention to what's going on around you because that's not what we were called to do. It wasn't called to look at people. Yeah. Uh, let's read Galatians chapter three, verses 26 through 29. And this is going to keep going with that whole remnant and spiritual Israel that Sister Mary Lou was talking about earlier. Okay, I have Galatians. Okay. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what is that promise that Paul's talking about at the end of Galatians, of that, that section of verses? It's, it's just reminding us Today, someone might read the Bible and say the Israel has been chosen and maybe say, oh, I'm not part of Israel. <laughs> but that's not the case. As Paul is telling us, through Jesus Christ, everyone has been called. So it's up to you to choose the call or to reject it. It's the same as Israel. They have been given the curses and the blessings. So it was up to them to choose. So today, too, through Christ, everyone has been called. If you believe in him, just accept his call and accept to be his follower. If you don't, obviously, that's your choice, too. But everyone, 
no distinctions, as uh, Paul has said. There is no Jew, there is no uh, American, there is no Rwandese, there is no anyone. Everyone has been called. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Um, and, and this is, I think, another topic that probably will address it one other time, not today, but just, that's, just a few thoughts, because right now people, they take their identity from the world. Uh, they, they take their identity from what they desire, from their pleasure. Some people, they call themselves L LGBTQ. Uh, some people, they call themselves uh, whatever. Um, I am American, a patriot. I am, you know, a cuckoo's clan or whatever. People, they are taking their identity from uh, the sinful, from the pleasure, from what they understand that this world offers them. But God's people are different. The identity stays in the Lord. We are, as, as also Ashil said, we are not Americans or Romanians, even though we, we have a nationality, but doesn't define us, our boundaries. Okay? We, we are not, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, racist. Uh, th this word is practically, doesn't, it should not be in the lips, on the mouth of, of a Christian. The difference is racial difference because in Christ we are all God's children. Amen. And this is this is what is the remnant. The remnant has an identity in Jesus Christ, and Paul has also advised in his time to make a revolution against those who are misbehaving with the slaves. So those in Christ, the slaves, including they were having rights and they were also free. And and Paul uh, writes a epistle to uh, to. Uh, many to, to advise them, hey, be careful in, in Christ Jesus Christ. We are free. We are bound servants, but to create free servants of Christ alone. So, uh, as I should said very clear, our identity stays in Jesus Christ. There is no more uh, nationalities or yeah. nationalism in the sense of, uh, of we, we, who should be, who should um, how call it, fight for our country or protect our country, defend our country every time. And I'm not against that, but we have to understand very clear that our identity is only in Jesus Christ. In other words, when people that tell us, hey, bad words, or you are not good of this, you're not good of that, or maybe your spouse, okay? I'm speaking for those people who are looking right now. They speak all these kind of words that you are good of nothing. Do not take your identity for, for what people they say, because God has valued you so much that he has given Jesus Christ to rescue you. So our, our value stays in Jesus' hands. Wow. And so as we wrap up this lesson, um, at the beginning of the lesson, it talks about where God placed the actual promised land, the land that he promised the children of Israel. It was at the perfect intersection of Africa, Asia, and Europe. So they could be a lot like the clock that we talked about at the very beginning, an example, a spiritual example for everyone around them because they had to travel through this, this land, this bridge of land. So how is your current placement in life a perfect place for you to be a spiritual example? That's a tough question. Um, You're welcome. Me, <laughs> um, I was just gonna say for me um, in particular, I, I believe that there's number, a number of people in my family who would call themselves Christian. Um, most of them are not what you would, what they would call even a practicing Christian. So to be me as a Seventh-day Adventist in the midst of this group of people, um, I definitely am the odd man out. So I, you know, I know most people understand what that is. We used to play that game as a kid, you know, the odd man out. And, and for me, that's what it is. I am the odd man out. Even though my children were raised uh, to, to be Christian, they are not practicing. So um, I feel like for me, I have to be even more... Um, a part of the Lord's army than maybe someone who's surrounded by 
everyone who is all of like understanding and, and like values and everything, um, because I know that they are watching me and maybe someday that will make a difference to one of them. If we, if we try to relate the call that Abraham has received, he has been called to come from his nation, go to Israel. Mm -hmm. But currently, what the Lord is doing is calling us to come from the sinful world to enter his eternal life while still on earth. Right now. So it's not about moving from, as I moved from my native country to come here to the United States. This is just for normal life. So wherever we are, we need to be examples to people. We need to be the light. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the world. So it's not a matter of moving from here to another place, but wherever you are, wherever you work from, wherever you go to school, on our daily basis, that's where we have, that's our mission field, actually. So we don't need to move anywhere, but just be example to people all around us. We need to be that light. I, I, I think um, I think also that well for me it, it, it gives me opportunity to to be a stepping stone and not a stumbling block because your life everything you do is a sermon to someone mm -hmm. and I am very much aware that the things I see and the things I do can come back because I always think to myself you know, what if my interaction with this person wasn't in the Christ-like light and then I meet them later on and I'm trying to tell them that Jesus saves, Jesus loves you, Jesus wants you. And they'll wonder, well, is it not the same person that did so and so and so? What kind of Jesus are they serving that will allow them to behave like that and come and tell me that Jesus loves me? So I... I I try to be, well, I true prayer, <laughs> true prayer, because it's only true prayer I remember. True prayer, I ask God to always help me to say the right things in the right way with the right expression on my face and the right body language, because we are a sermon to people in our homes, people at work, people we interact with, how we treat the cashier at the grocery store, the waitress at a restaurant, you know, how we treat people. So I think that should set us apart, especially now where people have to always remind other people it's good to be kind. And I wanna also go in line with uh, all, all of you said, there is no place that we go without being a blessing that God has sent us. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that many times we are, we, are, we are taking the choice, we are taking the decision to go in one place, to move in one place or to, to have to apply for a job and to, to have that job. And we are so happy that we have achieved that. We, we moved in that. But you know, God's people they are the one to, uh, to be directed by Jesus Christ in a place. Uh, and sometimes we don't like the place, but only to be the light. Um, I, I do remember. I do remember once I was in uh, in Peru, and um, I was coming from Peru for mission with my wife, and it was very difficult to find a, a taxi uh, because in, in Lima it is very dangerous. And I was living in that time to a brother in faith, and in a, in a, a very difficult neighborhood. So all the taxis, I was asking them, do, "Are you going to airport?" And they will say, no, I'm not going to the airport. And I was so afraid because I was, you know, coming from other culture. And in Lima, it's one of the most difficult and dangerous city in the world. Uh, I was part of that. I've seen uh, individuals entering in one, in one place and, you know, trying to kill. It was incredible. So uh, the bottom line, to the, the sum up is I... I went on the street, on the main street, and all of a sudden I make the sign to a taxi to stop. And the, the taxi probably went like 20 or 30 feet and then stopped the car. Then turned back and he asked me, where are you going? And I said, sir, I'm going to the airport. Uh, how much do you charge me? 
and he charged me half of the price. And it was so suspect for me. It was very, very suspect, but there was no other taxi. All the taxis I knew, friends, they were not able to come. So I said, okay, let me go with you, sir, because there was no choice. And I put, I, I took my wife also, I put the luggages and we were heading to the hospital, to the airport. I had only a few, a few minutes more to, to make it through the, to the airport. And in the car, I began to talk about Jesus. And all of a sudden, this individual had begun to have tears in his eyes. And he said, he said, do you know how was my day today? I just fought with my son. It was not my shift. I could not, I could not uh, work today. I was going, this is the, my day off. So I was heading to my home and trying to do bad to, to hurt myself because I hate my life. But when you make with the hand, a voice came in my, in my ear, said, stop the car and take, this, take, take him to the airport. And I talked to him about the love of Christ. I talked to him about the love of Christ. And, and, I, and he began to, to tell, God sent you in my life. Mm -hmm. God saved my life because of you. I want to thank you so much. What church are you going? When we were just uh, across uh, arriving at the airport, what church are you going? I said, I'm going to this Seventh day Adventist church. I said, next Sabbath, I will be there. I want to thank you and praise, you and praise God's name for, for what you have done in my life. And I was astonished. So every single time, remember, brothers and sisters, but your job, it's your job only because God has allowed you to be there to be a witness. Yeah. Your spouse, your family, your children are there only because God allowed and gave you that opportunity to be the life. And do not despair or do not be discouraged because you're not seeing fruits uh, in your life. Let God take control of that and he will bring fruits on the right time. Or maybe he will never see, you'll never see the fruits. But God has promised that whatever God's children will be, he will be with them and he will be a blessing for nations because God said in his word, I will make you a kingdom of, 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 of a priesthood, a kingdom of for many nations that everybody can see Jesus Christ. So I strongly believe that everything we are and everywhere we go, God is using us for a blessing. And if a door is shut, don't be despair. Praise God because another door will be open soon for you. Amen. Amen. And I think that is a perfect way to wrap up this lesson. Thank you, Pastor, for sharing that story I, um, because it, it makes it real and brings it to today's terms. Uh, so we will close our Sabbath school this morning with a prayer from Brother Ashil. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful occasion that you gave to us. We thank you a lot for your love. As we have seen from the lesson, it's only by your love that we have been called. It's not that we were strong people. It's not that we were good people. It's not that we were righteous, but it's because of your love. We thank you for your love. Uh, Father, we have seen that this call has a responsibility First of all, we have to be obedient, obedient to your laws. Help us to be committed. Help us to go through the journey. Help us to go through the way that you have prepared for us to be saved. Our Father, again, we have seen that we need to be the light of the people around us. We have seen that we are the salt. We are like the watch that has to direct people, has to tell them the time. Father. We are living with our families. We are living with our neighbors. Help us to be the light to them. Help us to guide them to the right position where they have to meet Jesus as he has promised. Amen. We are waiting for a second coming. We have seen that our uh, fathers have failed to be obedient have, have, with the results of their choice. We have this choice to make to either to follow you or to reject you, help us to choose you and be your descendants. Father, be with us on this Sabbath. Keep blessing this technology that we can be able to spread the gospel and share with our loved one all around the world. Be with your church. We have seen that you have a church that is still remaining and is to 
spread the gospel, help us be with us. May your Holy Spirit guide us through this journey till you come and redeem us to the heaven. In Jesus, pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that closing prayer. And I thank you all for joining our Sabbath school this morning, uh, both our panel and those who are watching us. And we hope that you enjoyed the lesson. Um, please join us next week as we are back here at the same time to study the covenant at Sinai. So we hope you have a wonderful Sabbath and we'll see you next week. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.